Hey guys, welcome back to How to Roll Dice. I'm Josh, and today we're gonna to be doing a review and walkthrough of this game here, Cairn by Matajo Games, or Matago Games. I'm still not exactly certain how you pronounce that. Cairn is a wonderful game for two players that has those players taking on the roles of warring or feuding shamanistic tribes, sort of druid folk, uh, in this wonderful forest setting after having woken up in the spring after the long winter. Uh, the point of the game is to basically knock your opponent's pieces off the board and or rush into your opponent's village and in doing so, you'll place megaliths onto the board. Megaliths are these sort of stones of power. For every megalith that you place, you're going to score a point, and the first player to score three points wins the game. This is a chess-like, uh, abstract-ish game. Um, I say chess-like because chess to me is very tedious and monotonous and methodical and uh, very abstract, and it's a bit grindy and a, a, a bit overwhelming. Um, but at the same time, uh, this is also not fully an abstract game because it has a theme. It has a very visual theme. It has a very vibrant theme. Uh, this game is actually designed by the same guy who made Inish, uh, which I now know is pronounced Inish and not Innis, like I originally thought. Many people have informed me. Thank you. Um, it's designed by the same designer and it's produced by the same company. So I was very interested in picking it up and I have not been disappointed. It's a very fun, very simple to learn, very enjoyable game. I've played many rounds of it, many matches. I've had my friends play matches of it against each other. Everybody is really enjoyed it. So getting into what comes in the box, we have the board itself. This is a five by five grid, nice big spaces that depicts the forest area that you're gonna be fighting on. On either side, you have the different tribe villages, one for the sea and one for the forest. On one side, you have squares for the action tiles. And on the other, you have point trackers for the players to mark their three points that they wanna score from their megaliths. And then two megalith spaces that are meant to represent the sort of next on deck megaliths, the ones that are gonna be built next. Uh, moving on from that, we have the actual player pieces, five blue, which are the sea tribe, and five brown, which are the forest tribe. These are very cute sculpts. I really like them. They're not perfect. They're not going to be the highest end sculpt you've ever seen, but they're nice. They're really nice quality. This is a very affordable game for, in my opinion, for the quality of the stuff that you get with it and the look of it on a table. I really like it. Um, but you've got these unique little sculpts. All of these pieces work the same way. There's no, it's not like chess where you have like a bishop and a rook and a knight. All of these pieces work exactly the same way. So the sculpts are just to be fun and to be nice. Uh, you've got these five, or sorry, these four action tiles here, three of which are the standard actions you can take during your turn, one of which is the transformation action. That's for the most part how you're gonna be putting megaliths onto the board. You've got these three player reference cards here. These give you a reminder as to what you can do during your turn, sort of how your turn works, and then also how the different megaliths function. Each megalith in this megalith stack right here uh, is actually a unique power that can be activated by either player once it's built. They do things like teleport pieces, teleport other uh, megaliths, destroy pieces, uh, move other pieces around on the board, things like that. Lots of fun. You've got these two point trackers here, one for the sea tribe and one for the forest tribe, and that's how you're going to track how many points you've scored from megalith placement. And then you have these three rule books here. There's three of them, not because there's a lot of rules, there's actually very few rules. These are only about five or six pages long. Um, but it's, it's because everything in this game comes in three languages. You've got English, you've got uh, French, and you've got, I believe, Dutch. Don't quote me on that, I'm terrible with flags. Um, but the three rule books are in those three different languages. And then the player reference cards are actually reversible. And on the different sides, you have combinations of English, French, and again, I believe Dutch. Um, and so that's that's pretty nifty that they include that. Uh, the other thing I love about the components of this game before we get into the setup and the gameplay is the box. The inside of this box is a lovely sort of vacuum formed mold that all of your pieces fit into in the best way. Um, when this box is sort of put together and you've got all the pieces in their right spot, all the tokens, the board, the books, you could throw this thing down a flight of stairs and nothing's going to move. This is a very well designed insert for this box. I really appreciate that. Nowhere near enough game put the effort into properly allowing you to store the game in the box. Uh, much appreciated. So getting into the actual setup of the game. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna put the board in between the two players with the forest village side facing one player and the sea village side facing the other player. Uh, the players are then going to take the matching tribe. So sea player is going to take the blue pieces and forest player is going to take the brown pieces and they're going to put them into their village. You're then going to grab three of those pieces, doesn't matter which, and you're going to place them onto your starting spaces. That's the three spaces in the back row that do not have a totem on them. The totems are these sort of squared uh, squared areas that have sticks with crystals on them 
minimum, one white, one black per player. Uh, so you're going to start on your leftmost, your center, and your rightmost spaces one shaman each. You can only ever have one shaman on a space in this game. The other two are going to remain in your village. They're sort of in waiting, ready to go when you need them. You're then going to take the four action tiles and flip them up into the air like a coin. Uh, that's because those action tiles are double-sided and the actions, each action, actually has a variant on either side. You're then going to take the three standard actions and place them on the white spaces and the one transformation action and place that on the red space. Uh, you're then going to take your two player tokens. You're going to place them on the farthest back space, the lowest space, on your trackers on either side. That's going to move up every time you score a point. First player to score three points wins the game. Um, and you're going to take your megalith tiles. You're going to shuffle them. You're going to put them face down beside the board. You're going to take the top two and place them onto the two starting megalith spaces on the board. That's the center row, uh, center left, and center right spaces. You can see them marked with these circular stone patches. Those megaliths are the ones that you're going to start the game with. You're then going to flip two more megaliths and put them onto these two megalith ready spaces. Those are the next megaliths that could be built once a player has the ability to build one. You then decide which player is going to start at random. Uh, each player takes a reference sheet and flips it to the language side of their choosing, and you're ready to begin the game. How does the game work? Well, it's very straightforward. On your turn, you're going to take one of the three actions depicted on the action tiles. The three actions are move, jump, and summon. The actions do vary depending on what side of the tile is showing. So for example, move. You can either move orthogonally, up, down, left, right, if that's the side showing, or diagonally, if that's the side showing. Once you take an action, you flip the tile. So when it moves to the other player, they're going to have the opposite version of that action to utilize. If they use it, it'll flip back. Meaning if I move orthogonally, then you can only move diagonally. And if you choose to move and move diagonally, you'll flip it back to the orthogonal side. And again, I'll only be able to move orthogonally. If you don't choose to move and it comes back to me, I then have the diagonal side face up. This is an interesting mechanic. All of the tiles work this way. Once they're used, they're flipped. And if they're used again, they're flipped back and so on and so forth. It allows you to sort of strategize what your opponent is likely trying to do and block them by making sure that they never have access to the side of the tile that they need to do the thing that they want to do. It's a very interesting sort of dynamic thing. Uh, so movement, you've got orthogonally, up, down, left, right, or diagonally. Uh, you can't move on to a space with a shaman that are, or that already has a shaman on it. Like I said, only one shaman per space. Um, and I'll get onto what you're trying to do with your movement, but uh, that's basically how you're going to set up your transformations, your red tile. So moving on to the next action, you have jumping. Jumping is sort of a better version of moving. It allows you to clear more distance, but it takes a little bit of setup. The jumping tile has two sides, same as all the rest. You have jumping your own piece. Uh, diagonally, orthogonally, doesn't matter as long as you're landing on the exact opposite side of your own piece uh, and you're landing on a space that doesn't already have a shaman on it. The other side of the tile is jumping an opponent piece. Again, as long as they're adjacent to you and you're jumping from one side exactly to the other, doesn't matter at what angle, that's allowed. Um, jumping is great because you cover additional distance and it makes it harder for your opponent to read what you're trying to set up. And again, that comes down to the transformation setup uh, and I'll get on that in a minute. Last action is the summon action. That allows you to add one of your shaman that's in your village onto one of your two totem spaces. Which totem space you're gonna add them onto? It's the one that's on the face up side of the tile. So if currently the black side is showing, you're gonna summon onto your black totem. And if the white side is showing, you're gonna summon onto your white totem. So it's very straightforward there. You can summon onto your totem, even if there's an enemy piece there. If there's a friendly piece there, you can't. If there's an enemy piece there, you can and you banish the enemy piece, meaning you remove it from the board and you put it back in their village. So you kind of like and land on them and smoosh them out of existence. So that's a fun little effect. So those are your three actions, flipping one every time you take it, one action per turn. Then you have your transformation action. Transformation is not as much of an action as it is a trigger. It's basically what you're trying to set up. It's a pattern on the board that allows you to remove one of your opponent's pieces and replace it with a megalith and in turn earn a point because every time you place a megalith, you earn a point. So there are two different types of transformation. You can either have a friendly piece on either side of your opponent piece, so kind of flanking. And again, those have to be exact opposites at whatever angle, doesn't matter, orthogonally, diagonally. Um, as long as you have one of your pieces on either side with their piece in the middle, you allow, you're, you'll trigger the transformation effect, that piece will be removed from the board, and you'll choose one of the two ready megalith pieces and place it where that piece was. Uh, once a megalith is placed, as well as the two starting megaliths, 
um, anybody can use it. It's not just the player that put it there. They're fully open for grabs. Um, and if you land on one while moving, you actually have to activate it and have to do what it says. They're not optional. Some of them actually have negative effects, so you have to figure out how to deal with that. So. That's the first setup for transformation. You're gonna have a piece on either side of your opponent's piece. The other setup is having two of your pieces followed by an opponent's piece, so something like AAB. Um, and that's a little bit trickier to set up in my opinion, um, but it's, it's not so bad um, and it's very effective when you are trying to figure out ways to sneak up on your opponent. Um, the fact that you can use the jump action to clear a space and land in a position that they might not have been expecting you to get to, I feel like makes it a little easier to set up the, the AAB uh, transformation. But either way, if you set up either of those by moving one of your pieces or by moving one of your opponent's pieces to initiate that formation, you transform that opponent's piece into a megalith. Now, if you have a megalith already on the space where that opponent's piece was, you don't get to place another megalith on top of it, and therefore you don't gain a point. You still banish that piece back to their village, but because you didn't place a megalith, you don't actually score the point. That's the mechanism that scores you the point. Um, the other way that you can score points is by getting to the back side of the field, sort of your opponent's side, and moving into their village. Once you do that, you put your piece back in your village, it's removed from the board, and then you place a megalith on the last square that you were standing on. Even if it was inside of one of their totem spaces, you can place a megalith on that square. And again, that counts for point scoring, so you'll go up one point. First player to get to three points wins. There are a couple of other details as far as um, things you might not think of right off the bat. For example, uh, what happens if you move an opponent's piece onto a megalith using a megalith power. Does it activate that megalith? Yes, by my understanding. Um, can you activate a megalith without having moved onto it? No, you can't just start your turn on a megalith and activate it. You have to move onto it either by your own doing or by somebody moving you onto it. That'll activate the megalith. Like I said, you have to do what the megalith says. They're not optional. For example, there's a megalith that just says, banish the shaman standing on this megalith. And you might think, Okay, well that's stupid. Why would anybody move on to that? You'd just die. Well, then there's another megalith that says you may move any shaman adjacent to this megalith onto one other space. So you hop onto that, you grab an opponent shaman that's standing there, and you slide him onto the megalith that banishes him, and he's banished. Boom, he's off the board. You don't get any points for that because you can't place a megalith on a megalith, but at least he's off the board and you've sort of given yourself some space. As you run low on Shaman, or if you feel you need more Shaman, you take the Summon ability, you plop them down onto one of your two totem spaces, as long as it doesn't have one of your own Shaman on it. If it has an opponent Shaman on it, great, crush them, throw them off the board. Uh, you've got your Jump, and you've got your Standard Move. So there isn't a lot to memorize as far as what can I do. It's not like chess where you're like, okay, this piece moves this way, and this piece moves that way, and this piece kills this way, and this piece kills that way. They all work the same way. They're all the same piece, it's just you have five of them. Uh, you only have three actions, two variants each, so call it six actions, and they're all pretty straightforward. And then you only have two transformation setups, which are, again, pretty straightforward. The most complicated thing is trying to memorize what all of the totems do, and that's why, I'm oh, sorry, all of the megaliths do, and that's why you have the reference sheet in front of you. It explains exactly what all of the megaliths do. And there are, it looks like 12, no, 14 megaliths. So it's not like there's a thousand of them and you're trying to figure them out. And once you kind of get a feel for the way the pictograms on the megaliths work, they're pretty straightforward to follow. It's really not that complicated. You've got a symbol for friendly, a symbol for enemy, and arrows that depict if they're moving, and X that depicts if they're gonna be removed. That's pretty much the entire setup for their pictogram system. So it's really easy to work with. It's a really fun game. It only takes about 10, 15 minutes tops. There isn't a lot of grindy thinkiness to it. And you can kind of just relax and have fun. Even if you're trying to be strategic, it's still fun. It looks fun. It looks cute. It looks like a game. It doesn't feel like some kind of a math equation, which is what some other abstract games feel like. I said in my Santorini review that that's probably my top 1v1 game, possibly other than this, and I still feel that way. I still can't determine which of those two I like better. The thing I like most about uh, Santorini is the three-dimensionality to it and the fact that you can expand it up to three or four players. This doesn't have that option. It doesn't have that three-dimensional functionality, but I love the theme of this game and I love the way that it only has these simple mechanics that just do a little bit of shifting and allow for that sort of dynamic blocking and offense defense system that you can run by manipulating or not manipulating the tiles to mess with your opponent. I just think it's really cool. I love how it works out. So let's do a proper review on this game real quick. We have Theme and Immersion. I would give it a one for Theme and Immersion. I really love the theme. 
but I don't feel very immersed in the game when I play it. It does have that abstract vibe to it. You're really not gonna get into the mood. You're not really gonna feel enveloped in the world or the setting. There's just not enough there. It's too short of a game. It's too abstract of a game. I still wouldn't put it up as abstract as like checkers or chess or go or dominoes, um, but it is abstract in the sense that you're really not gonna get immersed into the setting. So a one for theme and immersion. Uh, for cost versus quality, solid two. I love the pieces, I love the art on the board. Uh, from all of the games that I've purchased from Matajo or Matago so far, their boards always have this lovely art piece on the back. Um, and it has nothing to do, I'm trying to hold this up so you guys can see it half decent. It has nothing to do with the actual gameplay. It's purely there because they want to give you a nice piece of artwork and they figure, you know, why, why not use the back of this big board that we're selling you to give you something nice. And I really appreciate that. Other games don't do that because it costs money and I understand why they don't do that. But the fact that they do that, the fact that they give you rule books in three different languages, same with the cards, uh, all the illustration work is great. Uh, I really like the minis, like I said. I just, I love everything about the look and feel of the game uh, and it's very reasonably priced. So cost versus quality, solid two there. Uh, moving on to ease of use, very easy to use game. You do not need a lot of space. You could play this on a kitchen table. The messiest part of the game is flipping the tiles up in the air at the beginning of the game. I constantly have them pop off the board, but that's just me being sloppy. Other than that, you could play this game on a two foot by two foot space. Very straightforward, very easy to work with. Players can sit face to face right against each other. Probably not the best thing for this point in uh, world history, but um, yeah, it's, it's really easy to use. So solid two for ease of use. Moving on to enjoyable. I think it's very enjoyable. I don't think any game that plays so quick and is so easy to learn could be frustrating enough to the point where you don't like playing it. I feel like games that take a lot of time, that take an hour, two hours, uh, longer obviously, where you know, you know, half an hour into it that you're gonna lose, you start to get that feeling that you're falling behind, that can be really rough, you get disappointed, you, you get really sort of overwhelmed with the game, you don't wanna play anymore, and then by the end of it, you're just completely done, you throw your hands up in the air and you're like, I never wanna play that again. I can't imagine something like that happening with a game like this, because even if you have a game where you just get completely bowled over by your opponent, what did you lose, like five, 10 minutes of your life? It's no big deal. It's similar to something like a, a Magic the Gathering game where even if your opponent completely trounces you, you probably learned a little something and you wasted what, five minutes, 10 minutes? It's no big deal. Um, same kind of thing with this game. You could play game after game after game. You could play you know, four or five matches in an hour if you wanted to. You could mix it up. You could do little round robins with your opponent or your, your, your opponents, your, uh, your friends, your players. Um, and yeah, I feel like it would work really well in that setting. It's just, it's not a game you can be upset with. It's too fun, it's too simple. It's just, it's enjoyable. So solid two there. And then for teachable, very teachable. There's not a lot, I mean, honestly, the rule book, I'll, I'll flip through it right here. We're looking at, we're looking at seven pages with tons of pictures. Honestly, if you compressed all of this text down, it would probably be one double-sided single piece of printer paper. That would be the whole game. Um, so super teachable, I'll give it a solid two there. So the only category that I find this game to be lacking in, and only a little bit because it's an abstract game, is theme and immersion. Other than that, solid twos across the board, total for this game, nine out of 10. I would highly recommend you give Cairn uh, a shot if you can find a copy. I actually had to poke around for a bit before I could find a copy two or three different game stores, but then one showed up and I grabbed it. Super happy about that. Um, but yeah, I've been very pleased with everything by Matajo so far. I loved Inish. I've loved this game. I just picked up Cyclades and Comet. Very excited to give those a try. Probably gonna take me a month or two to get them into my rotation, but very excited to try those. Everything I've played from them has been great and this designer, very nice stuff. So, hope you guys have enjoyed this review. If you haven't yet, please go down below and subscribe. Set your notification bell to all, if you think of it. Uh, it lets you know when I post a video. If you don't, you might miss stuff and I don't want you to miss stuff. Other than that, leave a like or a dislike. And if you have time, leave a comment. Uh, it helps the YouTube algorithm sort of churn me towards the top of all these videos that are popping up every day. Um, and allows me to have a nice conversation with you. We can chit chat, you can tell me things you liked about the video, things you didn't like, just how your day went, whatever you want. We can have a little discussion, it'll make things friendly. Uh, but other than that, I hope you guys have a great night and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.